Hello and good morning, everyone. I'm watching the chat bar and seeing folks from Virginia and Alabama and Oregon and Northwest Indiana. Hello, Miami, Florida. Ontario is in the room. We have North Carolina, New Hampshire. If you have not yet said good morning and where you're from, can you go in that chat box and make sure you do that? We've got Sacramento, California. Um, another one from Ontario, Chicago, Illinois is so amazing. Welcome, welcome to everybody. Oh, look at there, Alberta, Canada, An another Canada. Hello from Ohio. And I am coming from you um, in Grand Rapids, Michigan. So any of my Michigan friends that are also in the room, hello. Jersey Shore, stop it. Jersey Shore is in the room. We're really, really excited. Um, we are pushing 4,000 registrants at today's event. And I know there are hundreds of you right now that are joining us live. Um, we've been on this journey together for quite some time, and we're so excited to take the next step in this learning journey and glad that you could come along with us. I'm going to talk through some logistics first before we get started. Um, I want you to look at the Q&A box. So down here, there's a box that says, ask a question. I think it's probably on this side. Um, make sure you, you uh, pay attention to that. There's also a spot down there that will give you closed captioning. So you look at that, um, you can pop on closed captioning and the link will open in a separate window in your computer. Note that you can select translations in that window for Spanish, French, Haitian Creole, traditional Chinese, Portuguese, Hindi, Russian, and Arabic. And it's so exciting that we're able to offer that to you because we know that our Science of Reading Reach has actually gone across the world um, and we're super excited about that. We want you to know that all of the sessions today are being recorded and they will actually be made available immediately after the session ends. So you don't have to wait till tomorrow or next week or two weeks for now, from now. Um, you will have access to them right away. And for you, that means I'm sure many of you are not able to join for the entire time. There will be sessions that you perhaps have to miss that you'll want to come back uh, and listen to. And remember, use those sessions wisely to sort of share the love with other folks. And um, I can imagine some of you using them in grade level team meetings, in um, is all staff meetings and professional development opportunities. Uh, just, just share those, use those broadly, um, particularly this first ses session of kickoff. I'm so excited, but we'll hold on to that for a minute. Um, we're going to be monitoring the Q&A, so I'll be monitoring that throughout the presentation uh, that's coming up. If time permits, at the end of the sessions, we'll try to answer some questions live. Um, if not, you can come back to the recording where you can sort of see some of the, the questions being answered. So let's talk about what we're going to experience today and why we're so excited that you're here with us on the journey. I think I didn't introduce myself, so I think I'll take time to do that. Um, my name is Susan Lambert. I'm the Chief Academic Officer of Elementary Humanities here at Amplify, and I am host of Science, the Reading, uh, Science of Reading, the podcast. Many of you I know are listeners of the podcast. We're really excited about the friendships that we've developed through that podcast. We've intersected with lots of folks. Um, and like I said, we've kind of all been on a journey together to learn more about the science of reading. What does it mean? How can I start my journey? How can I extend my journey? And for each one of us, really that journey looks differently. And no shame for where you are in that journey. If you're just starting on that journey, good for you. And for those of you that are further along, please um, connect with somebody that isn't as far along as you are and partner with them uh, to learn even more. I know you are going to hear for, from, uh, from some great folks today. Um, coming up soon is Dr. Maria Murray. I was literally on the phone with her yesterday in the morning and we were, we were talking about how we can even learn more ourselves and amongst ourselves and, and sort of the, the kind of environment and situation we wanna bring uh, to this whole learning experience. So I encourage you, no matter where you're at, lean into that learning journey and you will never become an expert because that's the great thing about science is we continue to grow and we continue to learn. 
Okay, quick quiz for those of you, get ready to put this in the chat box. But I want you to tell me what percentage of students, regardless of background, are capable of developing as skilled readers. So throw in a percentage, I'm watching that chat box, throw in your percentage of what you think students can achieve regardless of background. We got 100%, we got one in there. Keep going. Other people have guesses about what this is. I love this. <laughs> And I would say it's close to 100%. What we know is 95% of all students, regardless of background, are capable of developing as skilled readers. But there's a caveat to that. That is only when they receive instruction that is sufficient to develop their learning, meaning that the instruction that they receive is based in science of reading principles. And that's what we are proud to bring to you is our learning journey here at Amplify on what does that mean in both like the basics of the science of what we already know and what are we continuing to learn more about. Um, and so this today is another way for you to understand more about how classrooms need to change, how schools need to change, how districts need to change in order to get on that journey and ensure that we're getting all of our kids the kind of instruction, the kind of personalized learning, the kind of assessment we need to bring together in alignment with the science of reading principles to ensure that it's effective instruction. This is a call to action as an adult responsibility. We have an incredible responsibility and opportunity uh, to do that for all of our students. So I am pleased to introduce our first session where we are going to be joined by both Dr. Maria Murray and Dr. Tracy Whedon, who are going to challenge us to think about what it means to be on a science of reading journey, and what it means for you and what it means for all students. So I'd like to introduce them a little bit in case you don't know who they are or their backgrounds, uh, to just give us some context. So I'm going to start with I'm gonna start with uh, Dr. Tracy Whedon. So Dr. Tracy Whedon is a seasoned leader dedicated to advancing liter literacy success for all and academic excellence for children regardless of zip code. Dr. Whedon has spent her career developing innovative academic programs while scaling transformational systems change. While serving for the past five years as president and CEO of the Newhouse Education Center, Dr. Whedon has expanded the reach and impact of this, this center from the local nonprofit to broader impact across the state of Texas and on a national and international level. The mission provides evidence-based professional learning to all educators, information and resources to families, and adult liter literacy services. Her background includes executive director of academic planning, an assistant superintendent of curriculum instruction and assessment, a coordinator of professional development in a central office. But I think she says her roots are in her beloved city of Detroit, Go Michigan, where she served as a high school English and theater arts teacher. And she professes to always be a teacher at heart. She is a graduate of the University of Detroit with a bachelor's degree in speech communication in English, received her uh, master's degree in EDD and Ed Leadership from the University of Houston, and is a loyal cougar. So welcome, Dr. Whedon. And alongside of me on the other side is Dr. Maria Murray, founder, CEO, and president of the Reading League, a nonprofit organization whose mission is to advance the awareness, understanding, and use of evidence-aligned reading instruction. Prior to founding the Reading League, Dr. Murray was an associate professor at the State University of New York at Oswego, where she taught courses related to literacy assessment and intervention for 10 years. Mm -hmm. She received her PhD in reading education from Syracuse University, where she served as project coordinator for Dr. Benita Blackman's numerous federally funded early reading intervention grants. Ladies, it is an honor 
to share the stage with you and turn it over to you to hear your expertise and what's really on your heart and what and your passion. So I'm gonna turn it over to you ladies. Thank okay. you and welcome. Thank you. Go Cougars. Thank you. I need to, I need to <laughs> affiliate with a <the> team. <laughs> I'm gonna share my screen now and we will get started. Good morning, everybody. Here we go. Yeah, we're going to get our presentation slides up. I have two little cubs graduating today from U of H, so it's oh. two reasons, being here with you and watching them. Oh, all. an exciting day. It really is. Okay, we're in present mode. I, I assume people will tell me if they don't see that, and we can get started. So um, thank you for the introduction, Susan Lambert. You're um, a dear friend and um, I love always working alongside you and whatever you want to do. So um, and thank you for the introduction um, of our organizations, um, Nye House Education Center and the Reading League. Um, I think Tracy and I, Dr. Whedon and I can say that our organizations have a very complementary missions. We uh, have do similar work, not identical, but very similar work. And we love to collaborate. And um, we're just at the beginning of that coll collaborative effort. I, I look forward to so much. So uh, we're very pleased to have been asked to keynote this beautiful uh, summit by Amplify. Oops, excuse me. There we go, present. Uh, even though we're not together in person, all these people, it would be wonderful to be in one uh, giant room together. Can you imagine the feeling that would uh, evoke in us after all this time of being isolated? Um, we do feel the support from you based on comments that we've received just in the last few days, people excited for um, coming into this together. So it's exciting to be among so many science of reading advocate friends who share that same passion that we do. So the theme of this summit is personalized learning. And most of us know that this means addressing children's and even adults and any learners individual needs. And we know that it's even more critical come this fall in what we hope is a truly post pandemic uh, educational reality but and we have to focus our attention and all of our good work that all of us do on their literacy needs of course and all of their other needs and as we're going to discuss here today um, i guess i would say we're at a really critical juncture where we have to marry <laughs> the those needs that children have to the science of reading um, we have to address those reading gaps that children have from every zip code from every home in all of our nations, wherever we live. And we have this wonderful tool that can get us there, the science of reading, like Susan just said. It, we can get 95% of our students reading proficiently with just um, tier one and some supplemental assistance. And the other 5% we don't leave behind. We, we call them uh, lifelong uh, learners, not treatment resistors or anything negative. We got to help them too. Oh, and I just want to mention, um, I love student achievement partners definition of personalized learning. Um, they call it, and I'm going to read here, an approach in which teaching and other learning experiences build on each student's strengths, address each student's needs, spur student motivation and agency. Oh, I love that. And help all students meet grade letter level standards and ultimately achieve college and career readiness. So um, science of reading, now more than ever, that was our theme last year for our conference, is going to play that critical role in strengthening this personalized learning that we all have to adhere to, um, closing the gaps and, that have widened in so many cases, especially for our foundational learners as a result of um, interrupted learning. And as we are here again to say to you, building equity for all. Um, Tracy, I'm gonna turn it over to you on this slide to say your wonderful sayings and. <laughs> well, Maria, first of all, 
you know, you're my sister from another mister. We are sisters. It's not funny. And and (laughs) it is such an honor to be a shoulder partner in this work with you. I love your spirit, love your heart for the work. And it's so important what you said, regardless of the zip code a kid comes from or the girl or boy suit they were sent here in, Mm -hmm. regardless of the dialect or the language they are loved in, they must have the currency of the 21st century in their hands. And that's literacy. Right. Right. And COVID has underscored that. It's either a COVID crucible or a COVID chrysalis for us. Right. right? <laughs> we are going to learn from this. And this is a moment to seize. And it's such um, a, an honor to seize the moment with you and all the other amazing educators who are joining us today. And I hope you leave inspired, encouraged, and equipped with something to take away to keep pressing on for all of our children and adult learners as well. Beautiful. Okay. Okay. (laughs) We're going, I'm having a little bit of navigation thrill here. So here is our second slide. And I want to let everybody know that this is not going to be a traditional keynote where there are a lot of slides. We are deliberately trying something different. And we want to build in some spontaneous conversation. Um, Wish you were here with us, but we we will have your spirit with us. And and maybe the comments in the uh, box will help us with that. But our content is going to hopefully lend itself perfectly to discussion and uh, we hope deep consideration. So we also hope to have some time for questions and comments at the end. So many of you have listened to the podcast that I had the very um, amazing honor of doing recently with Susan Lambert regarding the defining movement. Uh, The defining movement if you don't know, so I don't want to spend a lot of time on it because I already did the podcast and you can go back and listen to that. But the defining movement on the one hand is a group, a coalition of science of reading advocates that we brought together and we've been meeting weekly since September. Um, And we, our intention was to develop a definition of the science of reading because there are so many definitions out there and not all of them are exactly correct. A lot of misconceptions have um, weaseled their way into definitions. Um, So this Defining Movement Coalition, it's a, a couple dozen of us, but the power in a movement is especially powerful when it's a social movement. So, we, d- we love our little group, but our little group loves and needs all of you. Um, we've been working very hard. Uh, Dr. Whedon is part of that group, um, a very influential part of it, and um, hats off and, and applause to the others. Um, so what we've been doing is meeting weekly to really have conversations and do work around a couple of things. First of all, what is the definition of the science of reading and why should that matter? Words matter, right? And definitions matter. Um, I think uh, I remember in undergrad, I was we were all asked to define how we view literacy or we were asked to define balanced literacy and all of our definitions were different. And that made me feel a little bit uncomfortable. Right. But with the science of reading, I think it matters. Uh, because there are so many variations in how people define it, many of which are uh, way off base. Um, some of them are, for example, science of reading is phonics and that's it. No, it's so much more. Um, this can lead to vulnerability, vulnerability. And we talk about that too. What do we mean by this vulnerability? If the science of reading is mis- misunderstood, okay, um, entities such as publishers, policymakers, service providers, and so on, 
can claim to be in alignment with the science of reading, their product or their service. They can take your credit card or your school district's credit card and swipe it, and then we might remain mired in this decades-long, uh, just anemic growth pattern, right? If anything's going to count as the science of reading, or if we believe that everything out there is, you know, or some things that aren't are, um, we will not have the reading outcomes at 95% for our children and adults. And this is just completely unacceptable. So the Reading League, um, speaking from here, we just love drawing people together. I think the Reading League in and of itself is a social movement um, built out of a need, um, as is Nye House. So this is what we're all doing. We're giving our time to create this defining mo movement because our, our children are just too precious uh, to leave to chance um, and in instruction that is not aligned with the findings from the science of reading. So again, I, I'm already spending a little bit too much time about it, but I do have to come right out here and take a moment and literally ask each one of you, my friends, before this talk is over, uh, leave the talk for just a minute, you know, shrink us down, keep listening, and go to what is the science of reading.org and add your name to the movement. There is power in numbers. If we can get thousands and thousands of people to say, I stand behind the science of reading and its promise to get 95% of kids reading on a grade level and imagine what that would do for our society and our democracy. If we can do that, and we could even er eradicate low literacy once and for all, it's completely possible. That would show publishers and policymakers and all those decision makers at the top that there is a loud cry, a resounding demand throughout this land and all lands uh, that we that they prioritize this in their products, our laws, and our classrooms. And I don't have anything against people making money, but please make money on things that do not harm children and help them. So do join us today. There's a counter at the bottom. <laughs> uh, we have about 6,000 people and we'd love uh, the thousands of people that are here today if you haven't already to join that movement. Um, whether you're a Reading League member or you belong to Nye House or work with any other organization in here, please also join the Defining Movement. And do, there's a little tab at the top, maybe not today, or but sometime go into the tab that is the Defining Guide at the top. The coalition that I speak of and that um, we've been developing sections of uh, the Defining Guide that eventually every month we release. So if you join, you get an email and say, oh, the what are we? The Defining Movement has launched a new section of the guide, go check it out. And they're very short. We try to keep them about 250 words or less. Eventually this will be completed um, in midsummer, we hope. And then we'll even produce a tiny tangible defining guide that um, People can bring, you know, offer out in PTO meetings. Schools can offer it to their educators when they begin, begin a transformation effort. Um, state education policy meetings, et cetera. Your name, your name added to this gives it strength and, and, and credence. So, okay, and just one exciting thing today towards the end of this presentation, everyone here is gonna get a sneak peek at what's going to, appear at the end of the defining guide when it is done. So that's just a little um, tease for you. So you're gonna get it first here. Okay, so before we talk about um, that, that culminating portion of the defining guide, let's share the beginning portion, what I wanna call the preamble. So I'm gonna turn this. Um, Tracy, do you wanna um, talk about, give it a little preface for why we did a preamble? Um, um, absolutely. And, and it, okay. Yes, I would love to do that. Okay. You know, how we frame what we do is so important. And the why behind this movement is so important. When we think about 50% of prison inmates being dyslexic, 85% of adjudicated youth being functionally illiterate, when we think about having the highest incarceration, incarceration rate in the world, and it's definitely juxtaposed to literacy and, and functional illiteracy. 
the why is crucial. So to be able to have the honor of writing it and getting feedback on it was just beyond my wildest dreams. Mm. And I think that's a sufficient just to launch it. Okay. That is sufficient. Here we go. Humankind's most precious treasure is our children. And our future depends on them. Okay, there's no sound, Maria. Convergent scientific evidence. Research has yielded proven assessment and instructional practices with which every teacher and leader should be equipped. We believe that providing educators with this knowledge is a moral imperative. We are committed to evidence-aligned reading instruction being scaled with a sense of urgency in a comprehensive and systematic way by multiple stakeholders. We know that our children can be taught to read properly the first time. In a knowledge economy, the currency of the 21st century will be built on the foundation of skilled reading. Students who can read well have a place at the table of opportunity, whether their aspirations lead them to preparation for college or the workforce. We believe in a future where a collective focus on applying the science of reading through teacher and a leader preparation, classroom application, and community engagement will elevate and transform every community, every nation, through the power of literacy. Join us. Okay, so um, we can advance the slide to the next one. I'm doing that. More chat. <laughs> More chat. I don't know if you can see it, but they've got the chairs up for us. Okay, we've got the, oh, I'm finally back. Navigation issues. Okay. Oh, look at that's beautiful. Thank you for joining, friends. Yes. Um, I like that someone said also interested in the stats for prison and uh, literacy. <laughs> We've been um, having some conversation. So um, it's, it is time to talk now. We want to settle in here and spend some time in this moment and dissect some of these central concepts in that preamble that centers the entire premise of the science of reading, urgency, moral, imperative, opportunity, equity, social justice, a fundamental human right. This is not maybe going to be the neatest conversation in terms of structure, um, because none of this is neat and is it, and um, it's complex because it's human. So let's talk about it. Yes, let's talk about it. And you know, Maria, part of this journey is just being really honest, looking in the mirror of the past and the future we desire, and being real about how do we get where we are today? Part of that is due to anti-literacy laws that were established in the 1830s when African Americans, Black people were not allowed to learn to read. Now there were people who surreptitiously continued to learn, but it's so ironic when you think about our history as a country and now certain practices that set teachers and leaders up for malpractice, if you will, 
are harming the children who are the most vulnerable among us. Those who are navigating the war zone of poverty, where there's a class divide, and children from student groups who have been underperforming, not because they can't learn to read, right, right, but because they haven't. Educators have not had access to the right tools. They have not been coached. They have not been supported. Oh. And as we saw in the chat, universities really needing to own that. If you're not apprenticing teachers and leaders in the science, that's a moral imperative that needs to change if we care about our children and we care about our community. Preach, preach, preach that. <laughs> and, and Marie, I'm wondering, you know, when you think about, I call it the COVID chrysalis because it's a time to rethink, retool, and not repeat, hopefully, what hasn't been working. When you think about your COVID chrysalis experience, how do you want to come out of this? And how do you want to influence all of these wonderful educators who want to do the right things kids deserve? Can you repeat that so that people maybe put some of their answers in the chat? This yes. way we can involve them in this conversation. You know, I hear teachers say, I'm just a teacher. No, you're not. Mm -mm. You're a VIP and you transform the family tree through literacy. I'm an inner city girl from Detroit. I shouldn't be here. I learned to code switch. So I have the language for the boardroom or for my neighborhood. It doesn't matter where I am. I can be in any room and I belong there. So mm -hmm. when you think about as an educator, you're in a COVID chrysalis, what will your leadership moves be? Leadership right. is about disposition, not position. You don't need a title. You need to activate yourself. So what will you, what are you coming out of this COVID chrysalis with that you are saying, I, on my watch, this must change, whether it's in your classroom, it's in your school, it's in your district. What's your commitment to yourself and to the children you serve based on what you've learned about the science of reading? What a great way for everyone to wrap up this year and be mindful of that and go strong, strong hearted into next year with that sense of urgency. Absolutely. Yes, Cheryl Ferlito, a true warrior. Many of us are here in this group, wow. <laughs> I see good, good people out there who are working hard, they're pushing hard. And, you know, we have these, it reminds me of the book, A Tale of Two Cities. I don't know if you ever taught that, but Maria. No, I never taught it. I was on the social studies end. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's a, an amazing quote. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. Mm -hmm. And that quote is completely applicable to the time we're in now. So, you know, either it's a, a crucible or chrysalis for children. Um, and, and I'm wondering, I know you have a story. I want to share briefly a story about a young lady named Ayana. Ayana was identified as dyslexic and was placed in special education classrooms. And the teachers didn't know how to teach her how to read. And so she graduated from, from high school and could, was reading about a kindergarten level. She went to a local community college and when they screened her, they said, we can't help you. You don't know how to read. And so her to Nye House Education Center, we have an adult literacy program. Do you know that within a year, this girl was so driven, this young woman, she was able to enter the community college and she had, she earned an 80% average that semester. So was it dyslexia or dystichia? Or was it both, right? It was about preventing reading failure mm -hmm. and having that safety net early on by having good, strong first instruction and also early identification so that she would not fall through the cracks she could easily have been one of those statistics, you know, school to prison pipeline, but it doesn't have to be that way. That's, right. that's a story that just moves me and reminds me to keep pressing on. What about you, Maria? A similar story. Um, I tutored a young man. I met him when he was 24 years old and I brought my, uh, we met in a pizza parlor for the first time and I brought my bag of assessments and just the basic alphabetic assessment, I had to stop. He knew nothing. He graduated 
with a special education diploma, unable to read a single word, to know his sounds. And uh, he was, as, as you say, di diagnosed um, with dyslexia. And um, we met only one, one hour a week. Uh, oftentimes we only managed to meet 40 weeks out of 52, right? Because there are holidays and illnesses and so forth. And sometimes we met in a courtroom. But while we waited for our turn to go in front of a judge, um, I kept sliding pieces of paper over to him on the bench and we'd still go. But within five years, he was reading on a fifth grade level, approaching a sixth grade level. And then we finished after five years. That's what he wanted. But um, I remember the second lesson we had just using the handful of letters we had practiced. I made him some sentences and uh, just a paragraph with big font this big. And he read it very slow, very painstaking. But to him, it was a, he was sweating. And I remember him taking the sleeve of his white t-shirt and wiping his eyes when he got done, he was weeping. So I hope it is, um, I think that's a sad and happy story, but think about that. Um, mm -hmm. It was another case of dysthesia. <laughs> yeah. He, read, he learned to read at the age of what, 27, 28 now? a few or five, 29, um, but he could have learned to read when he was five. The fact that he did ultimately read, and so did your friend, and so do many adults when they're 52 or whatever. I mean, come on. Come on. That's, they, are, they were missing that. They, so now, these days, we can screen and prevent this. We can prevent it. And Maria, the irony, you know, the previous administration was paying attention to that stat as far as inmates, you know, on mm -hmm. average, 50% are dyslexic. And so they introduced a first step act and so they can screen inmates and get them, you know, get, yeah. get the treatment hopefully because recidivism increases from, I think it's 70% to 15% if inmates learn to read, but how ironic to call it the first step act. The first step needs to be early screening and early mm -hmm. you know, prevention of failure and good strong first teach also, the Barbara Bush Foundation had Gallup do a national survey of adults. This is fascinating. In the Houston metropolitan area where I live now, if adults could read at at least a sixth grade level, it would drive $71 billion of revenue in Houston. Think about that if we want to be nationally and internationally competitive as a country. Yep. Uh, why do we think are all of our presidential, are all of our presidents and their administrations in the past four or five administrations, administrations, excuse me, have implemented um, legislation having to do with reading? You know, it's, it's a bottom line, bottom dollar, a lot of money going out and billions uh, not coming in, trillions going out. So it costs, it's, it's not just even a financial uh, issue for our country. It's emotional, psychological, spiritual. Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. The, the, the burden of shame people <laughs> have to carry is unnecessary. And if we could send somebody to the moon, why can't we make this our moonshot? Right. Why can't we make this our moonshot together. Yeah. This can be done. There's a wonderful uh, uh, group called the Learning Alliance in Florida uh, that has a, they call it their moonshot moment. And they've been doing this work for a decade, building community support around their literacy efforts. And uh, they are also a member of our wonderful coalition. So they contribute beautifully to that. Um, everyone, if you have time today, jot down a video that I would love, love, love to have time to watch today, but we don't. I've watched it dozens and dozens of times. I used to always include it in my instruction when I was a professor. I think if you go Google um, San Diego Literacy Council, voices and faces of illiteracy, or just voices and faces should get you there and uh, click on videos. It, uh, amazing job interviewing um, a dozen or more adults who learned to read, but they, the angst, the tears, you know, what was it like for you? You know, um, 
were there books in your home? And she's like, you know, they're books. You know, we were lucky if we had furniture. And right. she, she did learn to read. Now she's in, in, and she said her tutor said, I was, I'm proud of you. And she cries and says, no one ever said that to me before. Mm. So what did that person as a child, yes. what kind of stunting did it do to her very life? And we know better now, friends. We know better. Oh, thank you for attaching that. Thank you, Andrea. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, how can we know that? Yes. And how can we have these tools and not immediately <laughs> say right. this is the law of the land. This should be the law of the land. You know, for me, it's a dri the driver for me, Maria. I think we have to remember our core values. Mm -hmm. And as educators, never get on the slippery slope away from them. And for me, my mom, who I talked to you about earlier this morning, she's mm -hmm. the anchor for me because she was one of those kids who was highly mobile. She went to 14 different schools. Wow. She was navigating the war zone of poverty, struggling reader. Mm -hmm. And I think about the other little Bessies out there who, if I don't stand on my reading and literacy privilege and pay that forward as a moral ally, how, how dare I not fight for kids? The, the children in particular who are vulnerable because of, we don't, we talk about race, but we need to talk about class. You know, COVID has really underscored the class divide. Yeah, yeah. You know, learning, learn, try, learn, try, trying to learn to read online. And maybe I'm, my permanent housing is a hotel room with my other five siblings and, and I'm supposed to learn to read. We've got to be real Yeah. about those dynamics. Yeah, and to, to do that, we've got to know how to get along and <clears throat> work through difficult conversations. Oh, shall we go there next? Let's do it, sis. Okay, let's turn this next slide, sis. <laughs> there we go. All right. The theme of the day is purple intensity. So we have to ask ourselves this question. How will we show up to do this work? In what manner? The work right. of prevention, intervention, consideration of all children, all all the while keeping that view of equity straight in front of us. Um, uh, we're the coalition. We're getting to that part where I said um, this is going to be the culminating piece in the defining guide. So thank you to all the people that uh, said they joined today. I. I appreciate it. And you know, everyone in the coalition appreciates it. Uh, Linda Diamond is in our chat. She's one of our coalition members. And I I'm sure others are. Please, um, if you're a coalition member, please say hello to the group. And and you, all of their names are on our Facebook, too. Or on, not our Facebook, on our um, website. So, um, Tracy, let's explain how this code of ethics came about. You, you went on to Twitter and made made use of social media to ask a question. Right. You know, one of the things that I'm observing that I've experienced, particularly as a leader, mm -hmm. is that at times adult ego gets in the way of best practice. Mm -hmm. And at times we may forget the why. And so if we forget the why is about the children and not about being right. If we forget to remain curious about other people's perspectives, you know, when I was growing up, my parents told me, be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. Mm -hmm. And that was a way of showing outgoing concern for my neighbor. Mm -hmm. Most powerful force in the universe is love, which is an action word. It's outgoing concern. So if we want to show up and understand to that other person's satisfaction, engage with them for what's best for children, what can we agree would be reasonable? And in the tweet where I asked the question and said, don't we need a code of ethics? Because, you know, social media is like the wild, wild west. Um, mm -hmm. Twitter and Facebook, right? Wild, wild west. Well, we need to have some boundaries for adult behavior That's right. because adults need to get their stuff together for the sake of the kids. And it doesn't mean that we don't have powerful conversations. One of my favorite books is Brene Brown's Dare to Lead. Highly recommend it because sometimes you have to have a rumble but it needs to be a respectful rumble yes, and a wonderful, wonderful educational leader and professor responded 
and came up with several really great ideas around what that code of ethics could look like. And we need input from our wonderful educators out there who would say, yeah, just like I've signed on to the movement, I want to sign on to the code of ethics and help people show up for each other in a way that helps kids. I love it. So we asked, I think we can name this wonderful professor, Dr. Nathan yes. Clemens. Um, we asked him, or you asked him, like, yes. um, to that if we could use his code of ethics for now. You know, this is a starting point. Yes. I don't know that it could change too much because it's that good. Uh, why reinvent the wheel? So here we have it, folks. Um, and let's dig into this a little bit. Um, and let's tag team. You want to take the first one? Oh, I would love that, please. Okay. So, oh, oh <laughs> you take the first one. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. I'll take it. Mm -hmm. Fairly critique all evidence. Do your homework. You know, I was over a curriculum instruction and assessment, as you heard, in the Houston Independent School District, and it's the seventh largest district in the country. And unfortunately, sometimes I didn't know what I didn't know. Connecting with movements like this one will allow you to learn, you know, start with milk. Don't be, don't be too hard on yourself. It takes time to kind of soak all this information in, but let's be learners together, critique evidence fairly. And for researchers, let's talk to each other, not just at each other, because the, the, the if our if our hope is that we see the translation of research to practice, if we can learn to talk to each other, it's going to accelerate that becoming a reality for our stakeholders. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, yeah, striving to consider opposing views, never blocking them out entirely, because there's always a truth uh, embedded in the opposing view, isn't there? There mm -hmm. is, and, and, and maybe Twitter is not the best place to have those probably not rumbles, right? Maybe maybe we have a a um, timeout symbol we come up with in our circle where we say, okay, timeout, we need to huddle, and then you huddle up with that person, try to understand to their satisfaction, their perspective. You listen into the others and see where we find common ground. Mm -hmm. And if we have to disagree and you know agreeably disagree, that's okay. But but putting it out there and pouring fuel on the fire and through social media is more about the right. It's not about the yes. Yes. Right. So what should we also do when we uh, build equity for all within the science of reading? How can we proceed in, in in what manner? Second one is seek clarification. That's right. And I'm going to read what Dr. Nathan Clemens suggests for this. Do not accept evidence without looking close closely. If things are unclear or ambiguous, seek clarification. Ask the authors. This is so true. Ask the authors. Email them. Reach out. Can you explain this to me? They love to um, know that someone's reading their work and it's not just going into the abyss of a university library. <laughs> Researchers can be accessed through social media, uh, LinkedIn, you name it, email it, address. You can find them easily. Um, take time to look at the studies presenters or program developers are citing and ask, do these really support the claims? Um, and if it's if there's too much jargon in it, ask them to simplify. So seek clarification. Um, and when there are opposing views to those clarification pieces, um, keep digging. And we had a great example of somebody who was, you know, brave. Mm -hmm. Enough to step into the arena, respectful. Mm -hmm. and, and I'd like to, I think we should acknowledge that person. Please, if you'd like, go ahead. Mm -hmm. I, I'd like you to do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, so um, I, we got an email from uh, Dr. Nell Duke a few weeks ago. This is a prime example of reaching out for clarification and um, uh, wanting to add something else to our work as a defining movement. So yesterday, uh, around this time, we had our Defining Movement meeting. She graciously joined us, uh, was very um, gracious in saying all the things she loved about our definition, and then uh, narrowed into one part that she thought we were too narrow in. And 
she was right. You know, we're going to uh, fix that one little part. That's fine. And so that's the kind of example that can be set. So our group was willing to listen. She was willing to approach and a resolution was almost instantaneous. And you it was know what great. really impressed me, Maria? Mm. I, have, I have to acknowledge someone I really highly regard. That's Dr. Louisa Motes. And, uh -huh. and for me, you know, she is one of our research moms. <laughs> and she was one of the first people to step up to the plate and really listen, lean in. Mm -hmm. Iron sharpens iron if we allow it to. And yeah. so had Mel not come to the circle, mm -hmm. we would not have had a, even a better defining movement because of her feeling. Right. And 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 I that was a great example for me about how to show up as a researcher, how to show up as a systems change agent and listen and hear mm -hmm. and receive. And then there were some things where we agreed, disagree, we disagreed, but we mm -hmm. not disagreed. That was a beautiful example of what this could be. Yep. And, and it ties into number three, disagree respectfully. Mm -hmm. We don't mm -hmm. have to attack the person. Exactly. And, and I, I like how now, um, excuse me, Nathan, Dr. Nathan um, Clemens says, strong scientific and practice communities are never in complete agreement in all, on all issues. I know so many of us want that. We want the water to be smooth. We want everything to be, you know, just perfectly neat and in a and in a box and settled. But that's not how science is. I mean, just think of all the, in the last decade or century what science of all kinds has found out. Um, if there is ever complete agreement, something is wrong and suggests a trend toward dogma and fanaticism. Isn't that something? That's that's yeah. something to about, reflect on. So science yeah. is actually strengthened and advanced through debate. Um, Lo, um, Linnea Aries' work came out of de debate. We can go online. I hope someone can pull this up for the chat, a link to her keynote speech she gave and when she was president of the Scientific Society um, of Reading. And her keynote was about how people were arguing with her. And she said, fine, I'm gonna set out to answer these questions. So there have been some recent arguments um, from different groups in the science of reading on um, Facebook. Uh, we can't hide that fact. And some are saying this is a priority and some are saying that's a priority. Well, we can find that out. We can. You know, future science can settle these questions. Um, and it's not something personal that we should, we should never feel this is personal. Personal. No. So the what's- The time is flying, Maria. Oh my goodness. What's that? If the time is flying. Oh no, goodness. 11.53. Well, then we're just going to have to, okay, everyone, you better join the defining movement to get all the rest of the uh, under- <laughs> under detail, the details of the rest of these, but have courage to reconsider. Um, and you, you all can read the rest of these, right? There's, there's one that I want to speak to as um, someone who had to make decisions as a district leader. When, when you are determining what resources you want to use or systems, always think about sustainability. And that's number seven. There are great for-profits that are really about helping you bring about systemic change that lasts. And there are others, you know, buyer beware, be very careful and listen in to whether they want to stay in your pocket or they want to help you with progress. They're very, two very different things. Um, and, and the other thing is that, um, you know, let's lean into the best practices. There are next practices and promising practices. Mm -hmm. We can send, share these, this code with more fleshed out detail. But let's not stop giving kids the, the treatment they deserve because we're experimenting. They're not our, our little subjects for experimenting, <laughs> right? If we know the best practice, if we're not giving them that, then that's really no practice. That's fantastic. All right, so let's go to the next slide. We got to touch on the resolution trinity and um, give yeah. people a sense of what this part of the defining guide is going to be. Right. So, you know, when we have that opportunity to respectfully rumble, sometimes we're talking to somebody who can't solve the problem or help us understand. That's just glorified gossip. <laughs> so it's really crucial to go to the person closest to 
the discussion point mm -hmm. and, and have that, give them the respect of giving them the opportunity to clarify your understanding of what they're saying. Sometimes we're just talking at, e at each other or to other people. So this one's pretty straightforward. And it's just a matter of having the courage to tap into our values and give them that respect. So that's step one, if there's something that's not cleared up in the air. Number two, at times you will need a mediator. Maybe you tried step one and it didn't work. So then can we find someone we both mutually respect to help facilitate dialogue? Can we stay curious about each other's perspective? You know, there's not black and white. Sometimes we can get into this binary thinking. I'm right, you're wrong. There's a whole lot of gray at times. And that mediator can help us navigate that gray space until we understand more deeply to that person's satisfaction. All it does is earns and builds trust. And then we need to offer grace because guess what? We all make mistakes. It's perfect. Nobody. And so if we, if we allow that opportunity for mediation, it can be a real game changer in building those relationships and trust, which is the glue to moving things forward. And the last one is sometimes we have to give somebody an intellectual timeout. It doesn't mean that we just sort of, you're, you're silenced forever. No, it means we may have to let them know, you know, privately, this is this gasoline on the fire here and it's not helping anybody. So let's take a little time out here and let's circle back and see if we can have a, a follow-up discussion that's respectful and the intentions are directed towards serving children. Mm -hmm. So their purpose, uh, that our purpose and our why is so crucial. Where did the time go? I don't know. Someone stole it from us. <laughs> I did. I stole the time from you ladies. I'm back. Thank you for bringing us back and it's good to be back. I want to, can we go back to the previous slide just really quickly? Um, I want to read those bottom two lines because our little images are sort of in the way of that. Um, but what those bottom two lines said, said say are there aren't yet best practices. Wait, well, well, wait, what is it now? Well, there. Can you read those last two lines, Maria? Yes, yes, I'm having to. It says, if there aren't yet clear best practices, we, we will wait for next practices. Okay, I'm going to say that again. While there aren't yet clear best practices, we'll wait for next practices. Mm -hmm. And then the next line is that, super powerful. Science will get us there. Patience in the midst of urgency. These are just really two great quotes. So um, I, I just wanted to re reiterate those and have you say them one more time. Mm -hmm. um, ML, you can go to the next slide where we can show contact information. First of all, thank you ladies for taking this time to have just a really open dialogue um, and you know, transparent with all of the vulnerability and modeling for all of us how to lean in and really be learning leaders. So thank you so much for that. And I will tell you folks, when, when Maria said, reach out, email these people that you have questions for, go directly to the source, they will answer your questions. And uh, just this idea of, of you know, going right to the source to get some clarity, to understand the kids are worth it. The kids are worth it to make sure we understand um, and get all of our questions answered. So I just wanna say thank you ladies for this spending time with us been an honor. Yes. And a reminder that this recording will be available for anybody to go back and re-listen, which I'm sure you're going to want to, because there were a lot, there were, a, there was a lot in here. Um, links are going to be available to the defining movement. Make sure you get yourself signed up and we're going to take a quick five minute break, but then join us back for um, a crash course on stimulus funding. And what you'll need to do is just go to this upper left-hand corner. There's a schedule button up there um, and you can just hit that in the corner and it drops down and takes you right into the session. So ladies, thanks again. It was such an honor. Thank you so much. Bye everyone. Bye. Bye.